So, you know how things sometimes just don't turn out the way you expect? I thought, that seems easy. What the hell? Let's go for it. So here's what happened. I wasn't planning on adding seasons for some time, but the idea for how to do it just kind of came to me one day, and like I said, I thought it seemed pretty simple. Seasons on Earth are basically the result of the fact that the planet is tilted, which means that different parts get more or less sun depending on the time of year. The Northern Hemisphere gets more sun in May, June, and July, and the Southern Hemisphere gets more sun in November, December, and January. There's some nuance to this, which means that the warmest temperatures don't necessarily align with the time our region gets the most sun, but we're going to skip all that for now. The key points for this simulation are, at the equator, temperatures are essentially stable, which means there are no seasons. And the further you get from the equator, the more extreme seasonal temperature variations are. This is represented by tiles turning whiter as they get colder, so you should see this changing over time with the full cycle taking 300 turns. Like in the real world, the hemispheres are a mirror image of each other, so the coldest turns in the north are the hottest turns in the south. As a side note, I also added day and night cycles because why not? These take 24 turns with diurnal temperature variations starting at 6 degrees and being affected by altitude and precipitation. At the moment, temperature has no direct impact on creatures, it only impacts the environment itself. So, the rate of plant growth on a tile is now linked to the tile's temperature. Basically, the ideal temperature is 25 degrees C, and the further we get from that, the harder it becomes for plants to grow. This means we should see the best growth in these regions, as they average around the right temperature, and they're close enough to the equator that they'll never stray far from that temperature. Around the equator, temperatures are stable, but they're a little too hot. And as we get close to the poles, temperatures become both cold and unstable. The interesting thing is that this is quite a simple change, at least in theory, but it has very far-reaching effects. Lower or higher plant growth affects the amount of waste on a tile and the number of creatures the tile can support, which also affects the amount of waste on the tile. The amount of waste affects the rate at which plants can regrow, and the cycle continues. And of course, creatures themselves are also a food source, so they feed into this loop as well. Also, temperature impacts the rate of decay, which again impacts the available food and everything else in the chain. It's the kind of chain reaction that indicates that this simulation is inching closer to a good representation of a complex environment. And considering we haven't explicitly implemented any changes to how creatures are impacted by temperature, that's coming in another update, I was curious to see what differences we could observe. An immediate consequence was that everything died, over and over again. But given that we're introducing a variable which decreases the total amount of food on the map at any given time, i.e. by implementing another factor which limits plant growth, this was not all too surprising, so I tried a few different things. Initially, I just added a lot more food to the map. There are two hopes here. First, I was hoping this would enable larger creatures to evolve since there would be less of a risk of them just clearing all the food from a tile without satisfying their caloric needs. Second, I was hoping that some creatures would be able to survive in more desolate environments since, although they are still desolate, they have more resources than they did before. Unfortunately, all that happened was that life exploded and my computer crashed. So I was back to square one. So I reduced the food to a more reasonable level, although still higher than in previous simulations, but everything just died again. This prompted me to do a little bit more than just changing a few parameters. So I went into the code and started working on something I've been meaning to do for a while. As creatures get hungrier, they'll be more willing to try foods that they wouldn't normally eat. And this made a bit of a difference since it helped prevent creatures from starving to death. But that difference was smaller than I expected. So, I looked a little deeper into the reporting and noticed that creatures weren't actually starving to death at all, and by far the most common cause of death was just growing old. That's nice, but it's not really what we want from an evolution simulator. So I bumped up the rate at which creatures can die from either starvation or dehydration. This pulled us back into a more reasonable distribution for causes of death, but again meant that everything just died over and over again. I fiddled with the numbers a bit more, but thought this was a bit boring, so I came up with another solution. When creatures are first spawned into an environment, the starting values for their diet will reflect the environment they're in. So, if they're spawned into a rainforest, their diet will consist mostly of leaves. If they're in grassland, it will be mostly grass, and so on. Note that this only affects creatures that are spawned at the very start of a simulation. It doesn't affect anything born into the environment through mating. This gave me roughly what I wanted. Often, but not always and not immediately, all the creatures in the environment will die. So we have a competitive environment but not so hostile that it's impossible for anything to survive. So, there are a couple of changes to note with regard to reporting and data visualization. The first is that we have twice as many creature avatars when compared to previous iterations of the simulation. The idea was that this should result in a more obvious variation, since creatures on the map will have twice as many avatars to compare their stats to, 
we also have a slightly different way of comparing creatures to avatars now. In previous iterations, the simulation would calculate the correct avatar by comparing each stat for all diet-appropriate creatures, which meant there was no possibility, for example, of getting a carnivorous panda. I didn't really like this because A, carnivorous pandas sound fun, and B, it didn't provide a good representation of changes in diet. If something went, for example, from a meat rating of 0.1 to 0.4, this is significant, but it made no difference to the avatar calculation since both ratings would be classified as omnivores. So now the calculation just takes the creature's meat rating into account for the overall calculation, which means killer pandas are a real possibility. The only downside of this is that you can't simply look at a map and just assume you're looking at a particular type of diet. But hey, we have data, so we should be all good. So we can now see which tile every creature is occupying based on a typical coordinate system, and we can see the biomes associated with those tiles. This should open up some new possibilities for understanding what's going on in particular regions. And speaking of data, you should check out this free and easy way to learn computer science, math, and data science. Brilliant.org is the best way to level up your skills in a fun and interactive environment. I'm using Brilliant to learn more about neural networks when I could otherwise be melting my brain with social media. Whether you want to power through an entire course for a new skill as fast as possible, or spend just 10 minutes a week topping up the skills you already have, Brilliant customizes content to fit your needs and adds new lessons every month, including thinking in code and exploring data visually. There's thousands of lessons from beginner to advanced, so try Brilliant for free for a full 30 days. Visit brilliant.org slash 8littlebears, or click the link in the description. So, jumping into this episode's simulation, we have a map with some pretty favorable starting areas. They are the ideal temperature zones which average around 25 degrees C and have relatively low variation. They also have good access to water and are semi-isolated, but with opportunities for expansion when the population is ready. So we've started with some base stats that are pretty close to our pygmy hog avatars, and things progress pretty quickly. By our first flyover at 12,000 turns, we have three major playstyles that are all represented by various badger builds. As you can imagine, we haven't had much time so things are still pretty stable, although there's been a pretty sharp decline in creature speed. First, as I mentioned before, this map still has more resources per tile than any of the previous ones, which means that moving to other tiles is less valuable as long as a creature is in a tile that has good growth. It also means that creatures will be less reliant on predation since alternative food will typically be available. Second, seasons have caused the southern and northern regions of our map to be more hostile since they'll be spending a significant amount of time in freezing temperatures and essentially unable to grow food, which, again, makes moving around a lot less valuable or even a liability. By contrast, you'll notice that our cold zones never really reach this region, so it has good growth year-round and supports a pretty consistent large population. Also, as a bit of a side note, we can see the effects of creatures leaving waste behind on plant growth here, but mostly I'm pointing that out because it looks quite satisfying. Anyway, by turn 48,000, we have a slightly more diverse world, with larger omnivores taking a foothold alongside our badgers. Looking at the data, we can see that speed is still falling, although the rate of decline has slowed, and stealth has also declined. Remember that the major downside of a high stealth rating is that it reduces a creature's movement speed, but not its attack speed. So a reduction in stealth can offset a reduction in speed to some extent. What this means is that creatures are essentially reducing their combat ability, which is affected by both speed and stealth, and reducing their energy requirements, which is massively affected by speed. This makes sense when looking at the diet data, as the average creature is focused on leaves, which are most abundant in tropical rainforest, which is where our creatures are grouped together. Now, we do have meat as a major component here, but the way the code works is that creatures will always prefer their highest rated food if that food is available. So, again, I think this trend makes sense. The other thing to note is that reproduction is trending faster. There are many factors which could affect this, but I think the key things to consider are that faster reproduction results in weaker offspring that can't effectively move between tiles, and that those offspring can't effectively defend themselves. As we mentioned earlier, our food per tile is essentially doubled for tiles that are in ideal temperature ranges. This means there is less of a requirement for creatures to move between tiles, which aligns with the other trends we're seeing. Faster reproduction may be the result of our other trends leading to a less predatory environment, although it's noteworthy that predation is still common. Finally, there's also less diversity in the badger build, with the European badger taking the dominant spot, and it's not long before they outcompete the larger omnivores. Anyway, let's move on and see where we get to. Over time, the population recedes, expands out again, and then moves around, 
but its composition remains pretty consistent. As things progress, the smaller American Badger becomes dominant, but it's again paired with our slightly larger Omnivore build, represented by our Red River Hog avatar. And of course, there's a few other builds dotted around the map. This remains the case for quite some time. There's a bit of a decline in the population between turns 180 and 200,000, which corresponds with the spike in predatory diets, but it doesn't cause a mass extinction. I thought this was pretty interesting because we appear to have the opposite correlation here. However, the nuance is that this fall in predatory behavior is preceded by a fall in population. Less prey leads to less predation. With this one, on the other hand, the fall in prey is preceded by a rise in predatory behavior. More predation equals less prey. In other words, these are not conflicting correlations, they're exactly what you would expect. Following this, we have a slow recovery with smaller creatures maintaining steady dominance in this environment. But everything eventually leads back to the American Badger build, which seems to be the best overall build here. And around turn 230,000, the population really starts to explode, and my computer dies. Which kinda sucks, but let's see what happened. In terms of stats, we actually had a very consistent world following the initial drops in speed, reproduction, and stealth. I was a bit surprised by this given that seasonality is essentially making the world more volatile, but my theory is that this volatility kept our population isolated in this region here, which meant there were fewer opportunities for divergence since all builds would be directly competing with each other. For those of you that saw my previous video, you'll know that we had a very similar scenario with an isolated island that managed to survive for a full 600,000 turns, and it was much more consistent than the wider map. This is pretty interesting actually because it mirrors a particular phenomenon in the real world known as Foster's Rule. But anyway, the astute of you might have noticed this glaring drop here, which essentially cut the average time required for reproduction in half, and there was a corresponding impact on lifespan. So the strategy which caused our boom was essentially to produce tons of very weak, fast-growing offspring. But as a note, this boom followed a drop in predatory behavior, so the fact that these creatures started life in such a vulnerable state was not much of a problem. That said, Predation was on the rise again following the boom, so the cycle continues. Probably. Anyway, this is the last video I'll be posting this year, and it's probably the last simulation I'll be running on what I've been calling version 0. This really was a get it working prototype that I started for no reason at all. Given that the response has been pretty positive, I want to try and take it a lot further in 2024. The simulation isn't well optimized, so I want to re-architect a lot of the code so that it provides a solid foundation for the future. This is particularly the case now because, thanks in no small part to you, I've been able to buy and assemble all of the parts for a better PC. I actually used it to run today's simulation, and despite outperforming my laptop by a lot, it still crashed, so I have quite a bit of work to do. Thanks to all my patrons, and a special shout out to Possum and the others on screen. Your support means a lot, and it really does make a difference. It gets me one step closer to turning this into an actual career, so thank you. If anyone wants to join, we have memberships starting from just a dollar, and there's also a free trial. If we can get to 100 members, I'll think about setting up a Discord server, as it's a bit more powerful than what we currently have. Thanks again for everything. I'll see you next year.